Today I want to show you one of my favorite proofs in all of mathematics, but we need to do a little work to get to the point where we can even talk about it. So let's look at the following definition, which has to do with the size of sets, especially the size of infinite sets, because it's pretty clear what's going on with the size of finite sets. So given any set A and B, we say that the cardinality of A is strictly less than the cardinality of B, and we write A with a less than symbol and a subscript C, B, so that's like A is less in cardinality than B if these two things are satisfied. So there's a one-to-one -one function from A to B, but there is no onto function from A to B. So you might recall that we say functions have the same cardinality if there is a one-to-one -one and an onto function from one to the other. So if you just have a one-to-one -one function but no onto function, then you have a strict inequality in terms of cardinality. Well, let's look at some basic examples here. Let's say we've got the set A and the set B. A is just this set of three dots. You could think of them as the numbers one, two, three, or the letters A, B, C, but really we can just write them as three dots. And then B is this set of four dots. So I think we can all immediately agree that the size of A should be less in cardinality than the size of B. Well, that's because we could probably assign the number three to the size of A, we could assign the number four to the size of B, and then three is most definitely less than four. But furthermore, we can exhibit a one-to-one -one function from A to B pretty easily. It might look something like this. We could take this first dot to this first dot. We could maybe take this second dot to this third dot. And then just to mix it up, we could take this third dot and weave it under to this second dot. So notice that's most definitely a one-to-one -one function. But any one-to-one fun one function that we build will not be onto and that's because we'll always miss this fourth dot. And this is true not only if the function is one-to-one. -one. If we had a non-one-to-one -one function, we would in fact miss more dots than we do here. Now let's look at another example which is pretty classic, and that is the cardinality of the natural numbers versus the cardinality of the real numbers. So I won't prove this here, but it's well known that the cardinality of the natural numbers is strictly less than the cardinality of the real numbers. And we can easily exhibit a one-to-one -one function from n to r. Well, n kind of obviously embeds inside r, and we can take that as our one-to-one -one map. So we'll send one to the point one, two to two, three to three, four to four, five to five, six to six, and then so on and so forth. So this is most definitely a one-to-one -one function, but it's not onto because it misses everything in the open interval from one to two. It misses everything in the open interval from two to three, and so on and so forth. Now that's not to say that we couldn't cook up some sort of onto function. We actually have to check a lot more to show that that's impossible, but we won't do that here. Okay, now that we've recalled these definitions, let's get our big theorem on the board. Okay, so the main theorem that we wanna prove is from Cantor, and it says that for any set A, this is any set, it could be finite, it could be infinite, the size of A is strictly less than the size of the power set of A. Well, let's recall what the power set is. So given a set A, the power set is the set of all subsets. So let's look at an example. So let's say we've got A is this set containing the numbers one, two, and three. So that's a three element set. Now let's look at the power set. Well, there are eight elements in the power set, and we can list them pretty easily. There's the empty set, that's the set containing zero elements. There are these three singletons, each containing one element. These three doubletons, they each contain two elements, or another way to think about it is that they leave off one element. And then you have the whole set itself, one, two, three. Now maybe one important thing to see is that we can naturally match 
elements from A with elements from the power set. So notice the number one kind of naturally matches with the set containing only one. The number two naturally matches with the singleton two. And then finally, the number three naturally matches with the singleton containing three. And keep that in mind, that will give us actually some motivation for part of our proof. Okay, so now that we've got an idea of what the power set is, before we look at the proof, I wanna look at an implication of this proof. One of the most interesting things about this proof is it implies the following chain of infinities. So we could start at the natural numbers, the countable infinity. We could apply the power set and we get an infinity which is strictly larger. And that's because the cardinality of the power set is always strictly larger than the cardinality of the original set. Then we could apply the power set again and get another infinity which is larger and then apply the power set again and again and again and again, and we'll always get sets that have larger cardinality. Now you might look at this and say, oh, well, I've got the natural numbers there. That's kind of an obvious set to work with. Are there any obvious sets that these two are also equal to in cardinality? And there are. So the power set of the natural numbers is in fact equal in cardinality to the real numbers. So I think that's pretty interesting. And then the power set of the power set of the natural numbers is in fact equal to the cardinality of the set of functions from the real numbers to the real numbers. And then as you move up, you actually run out of like maybe common sets to compare these two. Okay, another thing that I'd like to point out before we get into the proof is that there's a famous hypothesis known as the continuum hypothesis that says no sets have cardinality strictly bigger than n or strictly less than r. So maybe we could write it like this. There does not exist a set A such that the natural numbers is strictly less in cardinality to the set A and A is strictly less in the cardinality to the set R. That means not only do we have an infinite chain of infinities, but we've got some discrete infinite chain of infinities. Of course, that's if this continuum hypothesis is true. And the existence of a proof of this hypothesis, it's kind of a deep question, which I won't really go into. Okay, so I think now we're ready for the proof of our theorem. So just to recall what we need to do, in order to prove this, we need to show that there is a one-to-one -one function, in other words, an injective function from A to the power set of A, but then we have to eliminate the possibility of a surjective function or an onto function from A to the power set of A. So we'll start with that injection. In other words, we wanna find a one-to-one -one function from A to the power set of A. And I motivated that while we were looking at our first example. So let's actually use the map that I motivated during that example. So let's define the following function. So it'll start at A and it will end at the power set of A. Well, that means we need to be able to take an element from A, I'll call it X, and assign it to a subset of A. Well, which subset should we assign this single element to? Well, I think it's probably natural to assign it to the single. Now we have to check that this is one to one, but that's actually pretty easy to do. So notice that if f of x equals f of y, that tells us that the singleton x is equal to the singleton y, but then that means the element x is equal to the element so y. So that means we have found an injective function from a to the power set of a. Maybe I'll just write it up here for good measure. It takes x and it assigns it to the singleton x. Okay, good. So now let's get rid of this and we'll finish it off. So to finish this off, we need to show that there is no surjection from A to the power set of A. In other words, no onto function. So we're gonna do this by way of contradiction. So in other words, let's suppose that G from A to the power set of A is onto. So in other words, we have a surjection. Like I said, we're trying to go towards a contradiction, so something bad should happen. Now, this is where we get into the beautiful part of this 
proof. And that is this really, really interesting set that we have to work with. So I'm gonna write it down first. So let's consider the following set, which I will call B. So this is going to be all elements A in A that satisfy the following rule. These elements are not elements of the image of A under this function G. Well, let's parse this out a little bit. So remember, G is a function from A to the power set of A. That means that G is taking elements from A to subsets of A. So that means this makes sense here because if A is an element of capital A, then it's possible for A to be an element of a subset of A or not be an element of a subset of A. Okay, nice. Now what should we do? Well, we assume that this thing was onto this function that we started with, and we just define this kooky set. Well, since this is onto, that means that this set has a pre-image. So let's take, I'll call it little b, in the set capital A such that G of little b equals capital B. And again, we know that this is possible because G is onto. So if it's onto, then every subset of A, in other words, every element of the power set of A, has a pre-image. And maybe really to underscore this, I should point out that this set B is most definitely a subset of A, which means it's inside the power set of A. And now that brings us to the following natural question. So that's how I'll write it. This is our natural question. And this answer to this natural question will really finish it all off. And that is, is little b in the set b? Okay. Well, let's look at what would happen under both cases. So let's look at what happens if the answer is yes, and let's look at what happens if the answer is no. Okay, so if the answer is yes, then that means B is in the set B, but let's look at how we construct the set B. This is the set of all A in A, such that A is not an element of G of A, but the fact that B is in capital B implies that B is not in G of little b. That's the rule for getting inside of capital B. Oh, but we have a problem because G of little b is capital B. So if B is in B, if little b is in the set B, then B is not in B. But that's a contradiction. That means that this yes, outcome is impossible. So the answer must be no, but we'll investigate that just as we did otherwise. So let's say that B is not in B, but then let's recall that capital B is equal to G of little b. So we have B is not in G of B, but that's exactly the entry fee to get into capital B. So that tells us that B is an element from capital B. So look at what we've got. If we start with B is not in capital B, then we end up with B is in capital B. That means that this is also not a possibility. So we've reached some contradiction. So that means we've reached some contradiction. So what did we contradict? Well, we contradicted this original assumption way up here that it was possible to find a surjection from A to the power set of A. So that means this must be impossible. But if that's impossible, that means that we have satisfied these two conditions that we were trying to satisfy in order to say that A is strictly less in cardinality than the power set of A. And that's a good place to stop.